Totodile, Croconaw, and Feraligator, the big jaw Pokemon. Welcome everyone, I'm Exceptional and I hope you are too. In today's video we will be seeing how quickly I can defeat Pokemon Fire Red, including the Round 2 Elite Four, using only my starter, whom I will allow to evolve. Challenge rules are in the description. As I may have noted in the weeks leading up to this run, I am so excited to be playing with a Water-type starter again. Of course, we're a Crocagator, so among the myriad of nicknames I could have chosen from, I decide to go with King K. Rule from the Donkey Kong universe. Oh, am I ready for this run? We can clear through the lab battle really easily, and we have our eyes set on Brock already. Similarly to Cyndaquil last week, though, we are gonna have to do a little bit of grinding. At level 13, we learn Water Gun, and I don't really see us getting through this battle with Rage alone. I trained my way all the way through Viridian Forest, defeating all of the trainers. This levels us up to 12, and what the heck, let's go try out Brock and see if my Rage alone is gonna carry this fight. Rage is an interesting move in that it kind of acts like a setup move, but not really. Every time that we attack Geodude and he attacks us back, it will essentially give us plus one stage of attack by saying that our Rage is building. How much of a difference does plus six attack on a 20 power move that's resisted by somebody who's also setting up his own defensive stages? Well, it doesn't go great. I went back to the grass to knock out just a couple of wild Pokemon to level up to 13 learning Water Gun. I wonder how much of a difference that makes. Hey, what's up with that, dude? You're level 14 now. I also defeated Camper Liam at the start of the gym here because Water Gun makes both of these battles trivial. I have a plan for Cerulean. Four times super effective stab or same type attack bonus Water Guns absolutely destroy Brock's Rock types. That's an easy first badge and we are moving on. Alright, so that plan for Cerulean isn't really a plan so much as it is seeing Bite at level 21 on our learn set. I'm hoping that that gives us enough of an advantage against the Rival 2's Bulbasaur. Near the start of the cave, we level up to 18, evolving into our second form, Croconaw. Aw, oh, good eye, mate. Our goal here is to knock out as many Pokémon as required, with a goal in mind of conserving their environment. Oh, Steve Irwin, the world misses you. On the other side of the cave, I make sure to grab the Helix Fossil, because we're running a blue Pokemon again, and that's about as deep as the thought process goes. On the other side of the cave, I make sure to teach both Mega Punch and Mega Kick. They're definitely better options than our current Scratch and Rage. Once we're in Cerulean, we of course have the option of facing Rival 2 or going straight to Misty. I'm thinking let's go straight to Misty. K. Rule doesn't exactly have an advantage here, but at least we know that her attacks are not going to be dealing a lot of damage to us. I do have a Person Berry equipped, and it's looking like it's going to take a few turns to get rid of Staryu. After she sets up her defense once or twice, I switch to Bite in order to take down her lead. Star Me, however, is always the Pokémon that determines this battle. I decided to stick with Bite because it's doing super effective damage, but I'm finding myself wondering if Mega Kick would have done better here. It only has 75% accuracy, but if it connected, I don't think we would have had to take the third turn here. Misty falls and we collect TM3 Water Pulse, which is again gonna be upgrading our moveset. I teach it immediately before starting the Rival 2 encounter. One thing about K. Rule, in comparison to our Chikorita and Cyndaquil runs in the last couple of weeks, is that any time that our coverage becomes questionable, we already have another new answer available. Pidgeotto falls to Water Pulse, and then Bulbasaur, we flinch him three times in a row. Amazing. Bulbasaur would have been the big threat in this battle with Sleep, Leech Seed, and other kind of lame tactics like that, but this time, not a problem. We clean up Rival 2 and have yet to encounter any kind of significant roadblock. After clearing Nugget Bridge, I make sure to pull down Camper Flint in order to gain access to TM43's secret power. It does have less power than both Mega Punch and Mega Kick, however, it has 100% accuracy and a 30% chance for a secondary effect. I'm gonna teach that immediately. Down on the SSN, we're doing a little bit of additional item collection, including Rest and Brick Break. Part of having that diverse move pool is definitely making sure that we utilize it. Against Rival 3 on the SSN, we immediately take down Birdbrains with a critical hit Water Pulse. Ah, it feels good. 
Against Ivysaur, I switched to Secret Power, dealing just over half, and now we get to see a little bit of that problem that Ivysaur presents. He puts us to sleep, so we just sit there taking Vine Whips to the face for a few turns, but when we wake up, we knock him down, and then we can clean up the rest of the battle fairly easily. Against our next gym leader, Lieutenant Surge, we have a type disadvantage, but I'm not sure that's gonna matter. I wasn't 100% sure as to which would be doing more damage here, Secret Power or Water Pulse, so I tried both. Neither are doing enough damage to Voltorb to take him down in a single shot, but we do take him down without too much fuss. Pikachu's defenses are quite bad, so a single Secret Power knocks it out, but I should have considered Water Pulse in order to avoid contact. His ace Raichu is last, who we're dealing over half to with Secret Power, again, arguably could have switched to Water Pulse here, but he just sits there setting up double teams while we secure the victory. Easy peasy. On Route 9, heading towards Rock Tunnel, we defeat Picnicker Alicia, leveling up to 30. The Totodile line is kind of a weird one as to how it follows the evolution levels in comparison to other starters. Instead of the more typical 16 and 36, we evolved at 18 and now 30 into Feraligator. I mean, how can you not be excited about this thing? Feral alligator? Give me a break. Just after evolving, I'm also picking up TM40 Aerial Ace. Just like I said, those grass types are starting to become a problem, and boom, there is a super effective solution. On the other side of Rock Tunnel, I will mention that we could have taught Rock Slide on the way through, however, I decided to hold off until a little bit later. Something tells me that I'm gonna want that move later in the game, and I don't want to restrict my moveset too much this early. As a Pokémon with more physical stats than special stats, I'm making sure to pick up a few of those staple TMs like TM27 Return in the gatehouse just south of Lavender. I see a move available to us from the tutors in the region that I am definitely gonna want to amplify these physical moves. Unfortunately, we can't get it until after the Round 1 League is defeated. I target the Rocket Hideout next, trying to get a little bit more extra experience before tackling our fourth gym leader. Honestly, K. Rule has felt pretty unstoppable so far. I mean, just check out this battle. Oh, wait, I guess this is the first battle that I'm actually showing you. Um, that back sprite. Oh, yeah. Mmm. Look at that posterior chain. Mmm, those ridges. I mean, they are ridges, right? What do you guys see? Speaking of feeling incredibly powerful, we even get crit by the actually somewhat threatening Kangaskhan, but our super effective Brick Break has something to say about that. Our next gym leader is Erica. I do have a Cherry Berry equipped here, but with Aerial Ace on our side, um, not gonna need it. Victory Bell and Tangela both fall to a single super effective shot each. Against her Ace Vileplume, we don't get the one-shot, and she puts us to sleep. Oh boy, this could be a little bit troublesome, but when she starts firing off her stab super effective Giga Drains, we honestly are not taking that much damage. We sleep a couple of turns and then wake up ending the battle. That is another super easy victory for King K. Rule. Our next bit of progression leads us back to Pokemon Tower and the Rival 4 battle. At this point, we are so powerful feeling in comparison to his team, one-shotting most of his Pokemon. This battle does start to reveal a recurring problem against Gyarados, though. We don't have the greatest coverage against it, and with the Intimidate lowering our attack by one stage, our damage output is a little bit lacking. We'll definitely see more of this in the future, but for now, Rival 4 is out of here. This leads us to Sylphco next, following the Rocket plotline. I do a little bit of item collection, but honestly I'm not that interested in spending too much time here. Instead, I'd like to head straight to Rival 5 to see how we stack up against him. We do decently against Bird Brains, really hoping not to see a Feather Dance or Sand Attack, and against Venusaur, he misses Sleep Powder. So that's two shots with Aerial Ace, taking down his biggest threat. Or so I thought until Gyarados comes out using the 40 fixed damage Dragon Rage on repeat to absolutely destroy us while we can't seem to get much done. In the next attempt, Venusaur manages to land a Razor Leaf, so we are hurt bad before Gyarados even hits the field. The solution though? Get incredibly lucky with flinches. He knocks us to 20 health, well within range of getting knocked out by another Dragon Rage, and we proceed to flinch him three times in a row, and when he finally hits through, he uses Bite, taking us to 8 HP, and down goes Gyarados? Is 8 health enough? Well, outspeeding and one-shotting Growlithe, followed by the fairly inert Alakazam in this battle, oh yeah, we win. Let's take the victory and keep moving. 
We don't make it very far though, as Giovanni's Nidal Queen in pretty much the next battle poisons us with Poison Sting, and that slowly whittles us down. Kangaskhan plus poison damage is just too much right now. In the next battle, you can see just how much Kangaskhan is able to do to us alone, as we don't get poisoned by Needle Queen this time and still almost get taken out. But this was little more than a hiccup as we prepare to set the cruise control through the last four badges of the game. We're quickly up against Sabrina next, and we are going to have a pretty dominant time here. Her Pokémon tend to be quite frail defensively, and honestly, we're getting things done quicker than she's able to do damage to us. In fact, the most threat that we find ourselves under is when her Ace Alakazam hits the field using Calm Mind the first turn and then hitting us with a plus one Stab Psychic on the next. We survive it and she's out of here, but that could have gone a lot worse really quickly. That's five badges, let's head south to Fuchsia. First though, we make a stop at the department store to sell excess of items and give K. Rule his daily dose of vitamins. I have plans to buy a TM from the game corner later, being a little bit more conservative with our cash. I only use the calcium, protein, and carbos that we get, and I grabbed a couple of additional calcium just to give us that little bit of an edge. I felt that in the round one league, we would be much more reliant on our special stats with a little bit of physical backup, and then that would completely be reversed in the round two leagues. I avoided all of the trainers on the way down Cycling Road, and now that we're in Fuchsia, there's not really a ton to discuss. The only thing I can really talk about is how at the end of the Safari Zone, we get HM3 Surf, which in my opinion is the best water move in the entire game. Just watch at what we're able to do against our next leader, Koga. After acquiring it, Stab Surf is darn near broken in this game. We're able to wash away his coughing in a single shot, while the more specially defensive and overall bulky Muck actually only takes two shots to take down as well. The next coughing is another one shot, and against his Ace Weezing, it looks like we're doing around three quarters to him each shot. Wow. Stab Surf, man. And this gym leader didn't even have a weakness to it. That's six badges, let's keep moving. On the path south to Cinnabar from Palatown, again, nothing of note really happens. I'm doing my best to avoid as many trainers as possible because in these first runs I'm always interested in what's possible before what's optimal. I'll also be skipping all of the training in Blaine's gym, even though it would be super easy for us to do. Let's jump right in. So you know how I mentioned that Stab Surf was pretty darn broken in this game? Well, against the final two gym leaders, we can also add the super effective modifier to that, doubling our damage. Growlithe, Ponyta, and Rapidash all fall in a single shot with only the mighty Arcanine surviving by a thread. You may have even noticed that I started this battle missing 30 hit points. Yeah, I didn't heal. I'm disrespecting Blaine that much. Arcanine misses Fire Blast, and that is seven badges. I have a round two finish in mind with my runs, and so I find that it's more optimal to help Bill right away in the Sevi Islands with this first little segment meeting Celio. I feel that gaining that little bit of extra experience and avoiding the backtracking later is definitely worth the time right now. Nothing exciting happens, so we're quickly ready to face down the final gym leader, Giovanni. Speaking of disrespecting gym leaders, this is the second one that I'm not bothering to heal before. Why, you may ask? Well, we're fast enough, and Stab, super effective, sometimes four times super effective Surf, absolutely washes away his team. Surf is in my number one spot, so I don't even have to touch the D-pad. It's just A, 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 we won! Our last major battle before jumping into the round one league is Rival 6. By the way, you may have noticed the new gym leader intros. I hope you enjoyed them, and yeah, there's new ones for the league too. We just have to make it through this guy first, and unfortunately, at level 52, it seems that our damage is finally petering out against Venusaur. We seem to be doing about a third to him, which is quite awful because when he lands his stab, super effective, overgrow boosted Razor Leaf, it takes us out from nearly full health. I wiped once more before I decided to go back to Celadon and purchase that Game Corner TM that I had talked about earlier. I mentioned earlier how I felt that we'd be leaning more on our special stats for the Round 1 League, and this plays right into that. Ice Beam is going to give us some great coverage, and I'm really hoping that it makes the difference against Venusaur. Back in the Rival 6 battle, let's see if that's the case. Unfortunately, it doesn't seem to be dealing a substantial amount of additional damage to Venusaur, but it does carry with it a 30% chance to freeze the target. 
with the help of two freezes against Venusaur because he just keeps sitting there synthesizing, we eventually take him down. But Ice Beam is also going to help us against his other problem, Gyarados. It gives us a high power neutral special attack to use against him so we can avoid the impacts of that Intimidate. It definitely helps out that we freeze Gyarados as well. This may seem like a fairly lucky outcome, but considering the amount of Ice Beams we launched during this battle, I'd say that it's pretty average. I just want to point out that our solo Pokemon K. Rule just annihilated his entire team and we're at an equivalent level. That's it though, our path through Victory Road is now clear and we are ready to take on the Round 1 League. This battle really demonstrates our lacking damage output against other water types. Against her Ice types, we can use Brick Break to carve through with relative ease, but even against Cloyster, our lacking damage really starts to reveal itself. Brick Break is dealing super effective damage, but Cloyster is a defensive wall. We eventually take it down, but we took a fair amount of damage in return. And against Slowbro, it's looking even worse. As the Water Psychic type, Brick Break is resisted, Surf is resisted, Ice Beam is resisted, and Aerial Ace at only 60 base power doesn't really do a lot of damage either. We aren't taking a lot of damage, sure, but we're in this battle for a lot of turns. Slowbro takes us down. After a couple of wipes, it's quite clear that something needs to change, so I hop back into Victory Road to do a bunch of training. Since our damage output against Lorelei seems to be our biggest issue, I figured that we would get up to level 60 over a few damage rounding thresholds. I did try once at level 58, which accounts for another reset that you'll see tick right away. Back in the battle, you can see that our damage output has definitely improved. However, Slowbro is still just too much of a wall for us to handle right now. When I was teaching Ice Beam before the Rival 6 fight, I thought to myself, Bite. Hmm, this move isn't serving us too much lately. Let's get rid of it. Gosh, it would have been nice to be able to use Bite here. I had considered going back into Mount Moon to catch a couple of Parises in order to get some tiny mushrooms to head back to Two Island in order to reteach Bite. A part of that train of thought, though, made me realize another reason why Surf is just so darn good. As an HM, it is reusable in this generation, whereas TMs are all single-use. So I pop back to Fuchsia City in order to delete Surf in favor of something else. I can just reteach Surf right away after the Lorelei battle, after all. My thought process at the time was that if we needed to invest the time to go catch those Paris and Mount Moon, I would do it. However, I have other options. Option one being teaching Earthquake into that empty spot. I didn't see it being too critical to our round 2 strategy, and being 40 base power higher than Aerial Ace, I was hoping that it would tilt the odds in our favor. We finally take out Slowbro, but then it's more bad news against Jinx. We can't one-shot Jinx, and as a result, because of attraction and more sleep, we get taken down again. I have a Chesto Berry equipped in the next attempt, hoping to mitigate a little bit of that sleep baloney. As it turns out though, Jinx is feeling a little bit more punchy in this attempt, and we get through without any fuss. Once we're finally facing a Water Ice type again with her Ace Lapras, we take her down in two shots quite comfortably. Oh, what a battle that was. Let's check out Bruno. Now that we're over that Lorelei hurdle, here's hoping that the league goes a little bit smoother. Against Bruno, Surf is going to take care of both of his Onyxes very easily, but it's his fighting types that are a little bit concerning. We do have Aerial Ace, which does fantastic damage, but it doesn't seem to quite be doing enough. That really reveals itself once his Ace Machamp hits the field, where our super effective Aerial Ace deals just about half to him while he bulks up. Well, that's not going to work as well anymore, so I switch to Surf while he uses a scary face trashing our speed. Then, once Machamp finally decides to get serious, he goes for Cross Chop, hitting a critical hit, and ending the battle. In the next attempt, things go almost identically to the first, except for this time, Machamp doesn't crit. And we win! That's now two League members down, and we're ready to face the third, Agatha. Agatha is notorious for a whole bunch of trolley tactics using sleep and confusion and poison, but K. Rule is going to be having none of that. Her lead Gengar is setting up double teams, which Aerial Ace does not care about, and although things get a little bit choppy throughout the fight, K. Rule does not really face any significant issues on the way through. If her Ace Gengar had gone for Hypnosis and Hit put us in a nightmare, then we might have had a different discussion here, but nope. That's going to be a first try victory against the Ghost Type Elite. The final trainer in the Elite Four is the Dragon Master Lance. 
he's gonna lead off with Gyarados, who intimidates us right away, already cutting the effectiveness of our physical moves. I have a decent option against him, but that option is Ice Beam, and honestly, with it looking like it's gonna take four shots to take down his lead, ooh, we might be in trouble here. Gyarados is less threatening than he is in the round 2 league, however, he is still able to put some pain on us if we take too many turns against him. Which he does, leaving us at 68 health and 1 Ice Beam when his second Pokémon hits the field. I knew that I did not have a shot against Dragonite using anything but Ice Beam, so I tried switching to Brick Break, but we can't quite knock them out in a single shot, we end up getting paralyzed, and the battle ends shortly after. Before jumping back in, I used an Aether to restore a whole three power points on Ice Beam. We actually end up freezing Gyarados on the second shot, but he thaws immediately. Then, with a beautifully timed critical hit, Gyarados is out of here. Super effective Ice Beam then takes down his next Dragonair, but much to my surprise, his second Dragonair actually hangs on by a sliver. No worries though, Aerial Ace cleans it up, and then four times super effective Ice Beam deletes Dragonite. Aerodactyl of course outspeeds us, knocking us down into torrent range, so it's a good thing that I switched to Surf. Stab's super effective torrent boosted Surf washes away his final Pokémon. This leaves one final challenge in round one, the champion. In this first champion attempt, as you can see, I forgot to heal. This is definitely not a fight that I can disrespect, so let's just reset. In the next attempt, let's actually discuss what's going on here. Ice Beam cannot quite one-shot Bird Brain, so of course I have to mix in an Aerial Ace and I get tagged with a Sand Attack. Arguably a better outcome than Feather Dance. The first section of the battle goes incredibly well for us, also hitting a critical hit against his Ace Venusaur, taking him out in a single shot. We're currently speed tied with Alakazam, and in the two shots it takes for us to take him down, he wins the coin toss both times, taking us down to 69 health. Nice. We of course one-shot right on with Surf, but then we're faced with that same Gyarados slash water type problem that we keep encountering. He's still rocking that Draconic Rage, using it twice to bring us down, while we do about half. In the next attempt, I've used two rare candies, leveling us up to 65 over another damage rounding threshold. The AI does something a little strange here. I switch to Surf against Pidgeot, but in the second turn of Surf, he actually switches to Venusaur, anticipating another Surf. I instead was going for Ice Beam, and so we are already in a much better position against Venusaur. Two more Ice Beams bring down the Ace and Bird Brains, bringing us back to Alakazam, and we're still at full health. Pidgeot did land a Feather Dance against us this time, dropping our attack, so I stick with special moves, taking out Alakazam with Surf, Rhydon with Surf, and then against Gyarados, we freeze. That freeze only acts as a nice buffer as we take him down to heal range, he heals, and then we bring him down with four more uses of Ice Beam, but we are still alive at 70 hit points. Arcanine is last, hitting priority extreme speed, taking us down to 37 health, but we one-shot with Surf. There goes the battle. I kinda love how this league was not handed to us for free, but also we weren't really stuck here for that long. Round 2 is gonna be way different. K. Rule clocks in with a time of 1 hour, 19 minutes, and 26 seconds at level 66 with 14 resets. This took 4 hours and 37 minutes of game time. After finishing the second half of the Seviallen plotline, I just have to take a moment to appreciate our PP management. Oh yeah, look at that. One surf left. But anyway, here we are on Seven Island. On the first bridge heading south, there is a move tutor that's gonna teach us Swords Dance. Mmm, mmm, Swords Dance. This is going to allow us to set up our physical attack stat in the next league, so I also pop back to Rock Tunnel in order to teach Rock Slide from the Tutor. Oh, and of course I grabbed leftovers. There's nothing left to consider, let's jump in to the Round 2 League. I take a quick second to rearrange my moves so that they feel a little bit more comfortable for myself. That lacking damage output against water types? Yeah, not gonna be a problem anymore. I set up a single sword stance, increasing our attack by two stages, and then one rock slide takes out Dugong. Our second rock slide leaves Lapras at a sliver, so while she heals, let's just set up another sword stance. Plus four super effective rock slides handle the rest of her team, switching only for Piloswine to surf for more stab super effective damage. That's Lorelei out of the way already, let's move on to Bruno. 
Remembering how much that cross chop critical hurt in the last round, I'm being a little bit wary about my speed, taking out his lead Steelix with a single stab super effective surf. Hitmonlee is only gonna deal damage to us, so I take the opportunity to set up Sword Stance, and then Aerial Ace starts taking out his fighters. We don't one-shot Machamp, but hey, at least we didn't leave him at a sliver this time. So he heals, we set up another Sword Stance, take him out, and then one more stab super effective Surf handles his second Steelix. Easy. Against Agatha, I once again lead by, you guessed it, setting up Swords Dance. A single one is not enough with Aerial Ace to take out her lead Gengar, so I set up a second while she just misses. Agatha is once again a fairly choppy fight on our first attempt, and at 177 speed, we actually are slower than her Ace, taking a massive super effective Thunderbolt right to the face. This, including missing the one-shot against Crobat, again leads to our demise, but hey, that's the first round two reset. In the next attempt, I set up a little bit smarter, but I actually took an additional turn of setup against Mistrevis, which was kind of a mistake. Mistrevis's Thunderbolt also hurts a whole lot, but because we outspeed and I'm more aware of how much damage we needed to deal, we do see a successful second attempt. Nah, that wasn't too bad. Coming into the Dragon Doctoral battle, I have one hope. I have a Lumberry equipped because I'm out of cherries, and this lead Gyarados lives to paralyze you, so I set up one turn of SD while he does just that with our Berry saving us from certain doom. Plus one because of the Intimidate, super effective Rock Slide does not do enough damage to knock out Gyarados, so we end up paralyzed, and I'm just gonna reset. We're so close to the end of the game that I just decided to start spoon-feeding K. Rule some rare candies. I tried once at 75, twice at 78, and here we are at level 80 where we can finally see a successful one-shot against Gyarados. Unfortunately, we do fall just short of the one-shot against his Ace Dragonite, setting up one more Sword Stance while he heals. His Ace Dragonite does no Thunderbolt though, so we are gonna have to be aware of that in the next playthrough. Spoilers. We continue falling short with damage against Kingdra, but honestly, we're pretty secure in this battle at this point. The biggest metric for success in this battle is being able to safely transition out of Gyarados without being paralyzed and having enough attack to survive the rest of his Pokémon. Even with those couple of missed one-shots, K. Rule definitely had the bulk to stand up, and we are moving on the Round 2 Champion. I'm once again concerned about losing too much speed in this battle and taking too much damage, so I take out Heracross immediately with four times super effective Aerial Ace. Tyranitar is out next, cancelling our healing from leftovers with his Sandstream abilities, so I switch to Surf in order to try and take this guy out as quickly as possible. He also knows Thunderbolt. It's a glorious thing that I can spend the first turn against Venusaur setting up our Sword Stance because he wants to set up the Sunlight. Our attack is now buffed and the Sandstorm is over, so yeah, good things for us. Plus two super effective Aerial Ace takes him down and then against Alakazam we miss the one shot and he sets up Reflect. So now our physical damage and Surf are doing less damage because of the Sunlight and the Wall. He heals while I set up another Sword Stance, do your worst buddy. He sets up a Calm Mind while I take him out with two more uses of Aerial Ace. Gyarados is out next and I make a little bit of a bad judgement call here. I knock him down to about a quarter with super effective Rock Slide, and I was predicting that he was going to go for a heal here. He did not. And honestly, the extra turn of Sword Stance was not necessary as the Reflect fades this turn. Gyarados set up a Dragon Dance, but we outspeed still and take him out on the next turn. Arcanine is out last, and it became a question of do I trust my range with Surf over the accuracy of Rock Slide? Well, Rock Slide guarantees the one shot, so I go for it, hitting through, and ending the battle. Like I said, round two with Sword Stance, much different. There are some Pokémon that I have to put a fair amount of effort into planning the second playthrough. This is not one of them. K. Rule clocks in with a round two time of 1 hour, 39 minutes, and 22 seconds at level 81 with 19 resets. This took 5 hours and 45 minutes of game time. In the second playthrough, I'm only going to be focusing on the things that changed or that I found interesting because, honestly, we've seen most of this run already. I've switched our nature to mild, increasing special attack and decreasing defense, which I never really felt was threatened last run. 
The reason that I'm leaning more into our special attack is twofold. First off, it gives us a better chance in the round one league, and as we saw, round two is no problem, as well as it fits in nicely with our egg move of choice, Crunch. I had also heavily considered Ancient Power as an option for some Omni boosts, but honestly, I felt that Crunch would give us a more consistent benefit overall. The overall strategy to get to Brock remains the same, only we're moving a lot faster this time with Crunch. I was also knocking out the wild Pokémon that we encountered, leveling up to 13 just as we leave Viridian Forest. I then still defeat Camper Liam in Brock's gym for a little bit of extra experience before defeating Brock himself, again, super easily. I had thought about defeating Brock with Crunch alone, but I was still thinking about Rival 2 in Cerulean. On the way through Mount Moon, I'm following the same ethos as last run, making sure to defeat a few additional trainers because that darn ledge. We evolve from Totodile into Croconaw, get I might. And again, nothing significant is changing, we're only moving a little bit faster because of Crunch. On the other side of the cave, I make sure to grab the Helix Fossil because blue. Yep, you know me. Against Misty, after defeating Staryu, we level up to 21 and we're trying to learn Bite again. That was the goal last time, but, um, Crunch is much better. I primarily wanted the higher damage output and bulk from being a higher level against Rival 2. I did still teach Mega Punch, but I elected not to teach Mega Kick this time in order to keep Crunch around. And Rage, though I can't justify Rage. Two Crunches take out Starmie, no problem, let's move on to Rival 2. Crunch is definitely dealing more damage to Bulbasaur, but it also helps that he misses both of his sleep powders. Hmm, well, a lucky victory, but a victory nonetheless. I'm also not going to be pulling down Camper Flint for TM43 this time, as I did not see it being worth the investment of time. Sometimes you just have to remember, all the small things, time saves, crunch brings. On the way south, I am going to be picking up my army of Meowths in order to get hidden power. We're not going to be playing pin the tail on the moveset this time like we did with Typhlosion last week, so let me know which HP typing you think would be the most beneficial for... for Alligator. Wait, Croconaw. Yeah. Things proceed the same as last run, except this time I'm skipping rest on the lower deck, again little time saves, defeating rival 3 with ease. But our third gym leader, Lieutenant Surge, not so much. I get lucky confusing him on the first turn with Water Pulse, but I also get very unlucky being unable to hit another shot. When Raichu stops setting up his evasion and finally goes for the damage, he hits us very hard, we still can't hit him, and we get our first reset of the run. An argument could have been made for teaching Dig here, but really, at the time, my thought process was a miss is a miss is a miss. When we hit through with our moves, the battle still gets a little bit dicey, but you know what? It's a victory, and we can continue moving on. In Rock Tunnel, we defeat Pokemaniac Ashton, who I might start calling Pokemaniac Paxton from now on. Game over, man! Game over! This battle levels us up to 30, so we're ready to evolve once again into our final form for Raligator. As we saw in the first playthrough, this lovely boost in power is going to carry us through the next section of the game pretty effectively. I follow the exact same route as the first playthrough, defeating the Rocket Hideout next and targeting Erika. The Erika battle itself, though, gets a little bit close for comfort again, though. We were level 38 last time, so we're beneath a damage rounding threshold, missing the one shot against Victory Bell and Vile Plume. This results in us getting paralyzed and brought down after a critical Giga Drain to 6 health. But we hit through the paralysis and end the battle, but whew, that was darn close. Rival 4 in Pokemon Tower falls next, but it's not him that we're worried about. Rival 5 is next. I do the exact same item collection as I did last time in Sylphco, but this time... I decided to use 5 rare candies before the Rival 5 fight. This gives us a little bit of damage and consistency. Plus, I mean, why not? I had a few left over after the first playthrough. I also have a Citrus Berry equipped, but I would argue that a Chesto would have served us better here. This is also the perfect time to discuss Hidden Power once again because I found it early enough this time that I decided, what the heck, let's just teach it. HP Electric is what I went with. It's going to help us immensely with our problem against water types, Gyarados in particular with the four times super effective damage that we can now hit it with. Intimidate this, buddy! Crunch does work against Sabrina, and so we're ready to head south for that biggest upgrade, Surf. I grab Surf and then Strength from the Warden in exchange for his teeth. What an odd thing to lose. Surf then absolutely washes away Koga. And we're quickly heading south down to Cinnabar across the sea, where I'm going to be doing just a touch of additional training. I focus primarily on attack EVs because special attack is so rare in this region. In Blaine's Gym, I'm defeating more trainers, again for more attack EVs, but primarily speed. 
We don't need a ton of grinding, but it definitely helps us out in the long run. With our additional levels and special attack enhancing nature, of course Arcanine falls in one shot this time. Yeah, that's about all that went different in this one. Then I do not do any additional grinding, washing away Giovanni and the end of the gym challenge along with him. Yes, I just covered like half of the gym challenge in about 50 seconds, but um, you saw this in the first run. There was zero challenge in this section. Rival 6, however, did give us a little bit of trouble last time, so let's review this battle. I have gone over to Celadon City in order to buy Ice Beam, but I have not taught it yet. Instead, at level 56, because of our additional grinding and those couple of attack EVs, we can rely on Aerial Ace to knock out Venusaur. Including the wonderful option of Hidden Power Electric to take out Gyarados, this battle is a complete flop once Venusaur is out of the way. Then it's back to Fuchsia City to once again remove Surf from our moveset. And finally, it's time for just a touch of additional training in Victory Road, targeting only the most dense experience that I could find. The goal is to grind up to level 60, then using 5 rare candies so that I can start the Lorelei battle at 65. That's it, let's jump in. The reason that I still put the time into putting Brick Break on our moveset for this battle is because Dugong and Lapras both have pretty substantial special defense and HP stats. It just made sense to target their weaker physical side. Especially when even with our special attack boosting nature, our attack stat is a non-inconsequential amount higher. Where HP Electric really shines through for us is against Cloyster, who is a defensive wall but doesn't have much special defense at all, and against Slowbro, who is also more physically defensive. Looking back at the footage, Crunch would have objectively been the better choice against Slowbro, but eh, it's fine. Learning from the mistakes of last run, I also had a Chesto Berry equipped here, but we didn't end up using it in this battle. That's the Lorelei explanation done, we can move on to Bruno. Against Bruno, just before the battle, I retaught Surf, and I also equipped the Black Glasses, although we aren't going to be using them in this battle. We just don't have anything better to put on here. Stab, four times super effective Surf, absolutely handles the Onyxuses, while super effective Aerial Ace handles the Fighters. Of course, we leave Hitmonchan at just a sliver again. So we lose a stage of speed, but we continue just working through the battle. Hitmonlee is a one-shot, Machamp is not, but our Surf is more powerful this time, and everything is coming up Madhouse. That's Bruno dealt with, let's see how Crunch helps us against Agatha. I actually was able to defeat Lorelei at level 63 fairly consistently. Level 65 was for Agatha. Including the 10% boost to our dark moves from our black glasses that we're holding, Crunch at level 65 is now a guaranteed one-shot, I think, against her lead Gengar. Then, between the power of Stab Surf and Crunch, we can work through her team without any issues. One thing to mention is that against her Ace Gengar, Crunch would not get a one-shot at this level, however, we get a critical hit, so, um, easy peasy, lemon squeezy. Let's move on to that Dragon Doctoral. Wait, round one. Master. He's still just a master. Obey your master! Master! Unfortunately, that last battle with Agatha was the last hurrah for Crunch, replacing it with Ice Beam in this battle. HP Electric, ugh, mwah, deletes Gyarados right away. Then super effective, sometimes four times super effective Ice Beams handle his dragons, with Stab's super effective Surf handling his Aerodactyl. It is absolutely incredible to me how much of a difference a single move can make in a battle. Lance is down, all that awaits us is the round one champion. A point could have been made to feed for Alligator a single additional rare candy so that Ice Beam might have knocked out Pidgeot in a single turn so we could have avoided that sand attack. Eh, oh well. Something even cooler is gonna happen. Because of the learning that we had during the first playthrough, we can just slash our way through this team and then we get to that problem of Gyarados. The cool thing is, is that partway through this battle, we leveled up to 68. At 67, Gyarados was a range, whereas at 68, I believe it's another guaranteed one-shot. Very cool to get that damage rounding threshold mid-battle. Effective? Eh, but cool. Uh-huh. Arcanine is last, and one final stab, super effective Surf ends the battle. I've said it a hundred times, and I'm gonna say it again now. Having a plan makes such a difference. For Alligator clocks in with a round one time of 1 hour, 1 minute, and 28 seconds at level 68 with one reset. This took 3 hours and 52 minutes of game time. 
Now, honestly, you all know the score with round two. I finish the Sevi Islands, I teach Swords Dance, I teach Rock Slide, and we're about to win this thing. For those of you wondering, not this time. Despite substrats being best strats, Feraligator just doesn't need it. So without any further ado, let's jump right in to round two. To be honest, not a lot changes in this round 2 league compared to last playthrough, I'm just coming in with a slightly more practiced hand. Against Lorelei's lead dugong I set up to plus 4 with 2 SDs, while she focuses on setting up her evasion. No problem, plus 4 gives us the one shot with Aerial Ace which cannot miss. From there, Feraligator completely and utterly dominates this battle. We even get a nice boon from Cloyster, where we miss our rock slide so that it gets Piloswine, our stab, super effective, rain boosted serve, definitely one shots. I mean, it did one shot him before, but you know, now it really, really one shots him. While I was playing this, the child in me definitely stuck my tongue out and blew a raspberry as Jinx fell because she's just such a pain sometimes. That's Lorelei down. Against Bruno, it's no surprise that we're going to see an incredibly dominant victory again. Stab Super Effective Surf is of course going to deal with both of the Steelixes, no problem there, and against his Hitmonlee, I set up a single sword stance, proceeding to carve through his fighting types with Super Effective plus two Aerial Ace. That's it. I'm done talking about Bruno, no, no. Finally, against Agatha, oh no, I had to put a little bit of thought in. I have a Lumberry equipped because it deals with one turn of any of Gengar's shenanigans. Unfortunately, in order to avoid most of the problems from the rest of this battle, I do have to take one additional risky turn of setup against her lead Gengar, which she misses Hypnosis. Plus four Aerial Ace gets rid of her lead Gengar and Mistrevus with her Arbok coming out next and intimidating. Arbok is probably the least threatening member of her team in round two, so I use the opportunity to set up one additional sword stance, bringing us back to plus five. It goes for double team. Okay, no worries, Aerial Ace wins the rest of the battle. I'd considered using more Rock Slide instead of setup in this battle, but it came down to a question of probability for me. It's been a long time since I dove into stats and probability mathematics, but hoping for a single good turn against her lead Gengar definitely felt better than multiple turns with a 15% chance to miss with Rock Slide. <laughs> it seems to have worked out. <laughs> Let's move on to Lance. There's one thing that I neglected to mention before starting the league. I did use the last of our rare candies, seven in total, to level us up as much as I could before stepping in here. This enabled us to be at level 68 for the Lance Battle, which helps us out with a couple of these damage ranges. Remember what I said in the first playthrough though about his Ace Dragonite's Thunderbolt? Well, in an unfortunate turn of events, we miss our Rock Slide against Dragonite while he hits with one Thunderbolt and then crits with the second. There are just some resets that you cannot avoid. In the next attempt, I'll just note that everything about this strategy is identical to the first run. I have a Cherry Berry instead of a Lum, mind you, but that's about it. I get to plus one against Gyarados because of the Intimidate and knock him out, then knocking out his Ace Dragonite after setting up an additional Swords Dance. The extra turn of setup guarantees the one-shot against his Ace Dragonite and the Lesser Dragonite, but does not give us the one-shot against Kingdra. Looking at the footage, I'm wondering if Rock Slide might have gotten a one-shot here, but again, Kingdra isn't very threatening to us, so Aerial Ace handles things just fine. Then against Aerodactyl in the back, it surprises absolutely nobody that Stab, super effective Surf, takes him down. After a dominant Elite Four performance, let's see if we can keep this momentum going for the Round 2 champion. Against the champion's lead Heracross, I'm once again concerned about our speed stats, so I take him out immediately with four times super effective Aerial Ace. If only the Meowth army had found me one more rare candy, I feel like we could have one-shot Tyranitar here with a single stab super effective Surf, but this is also the only place in this battle where we're under any significant threat. That threat being the 30% chance to be paralyzed by Thunderbolt. We get through him no problem, using the same strategy as last time against Venusaur, letting him set up the sun, cancelling the sandstorm, restoring our leftovers recovery while we set up to plus two so that super effective Aerial Ace can dominate his face. Does that count as a rhyme? Eh, probably not. 
Alakazam could be pesky setting up Reflect or something like that, so I set up one additional turn of Swords Dance, and fortunately in this battle, he just goes for Psychic. That's a hit that I will happily take as our leftovers continue to restore our HP while we dominate the last section of this battle. The extra turn of setup was of course for Gyarados again. He intimidates us back to plus three, which is still enough with super effective Rock Slide to take him out in a single shot, with Arcanine then intimidating us back to plus two. But super effective Rock Slide at plus two is still enough for the one shot. The champion has fallen. As we start our victory march towards the Hall of Fame with Professor Oak, I can't help but find myself thinking, Feraligator, Typhlosion, Meganium. Which one did I enjoy playing most? Feraligator clocks in with a round 2 time of 1 hour, 17 minutes, and 51 seconds at level 80 with 2 resets. This took 4 hours and 52 minutes of game time. So let's see how much time we managed to save between runs. Honestly, Feraligator played so intuitively with both runs that there wasn't a huge amount of time saving that we got throughout the gym challenge. Starting off with Brock, our grinding was a little bit more efficient, we didn't fight him unnecessarily with Rage, and the fact that we had Crunch just sped up the grinding a little bit throughout that first section. Honestly though, plus or minus a few seconds, our time splits stay relatively the same throughout the next few badges. You can see a bit of time loss here, a bit of time gain there, to catching Meowths or grinding at different times. The real time saves happen in the round one league, where we came into it not only with a better plan, but also two much better moves. We ended up saving nearly 18 minutes by the end of round one, and honestly with how smoothly round two went with the addition of Sword Stance, we only gained a little bit of additional time. This culminated in a total time save of 21 minutes and 32 seconds at the end of round two, one level lower with 17 less resets. So I've been a busy little egghead, and along with those new gym leader intros, this is the new tier list. A big problem that I had with the old one was scaling, and so I thought to myself, well, why not just dial up the resolution a ton? My videos release in 1080p, so I made this graphic in 4K. That means that I can still include poor Shuckle all the way down here, but it also allows me to zoom in without losing quality. Feraligator finishes about a minute before Raikou, which I think goes to show just how powerful this Pokémon is. If we take a second to compare Feraligator to both Typhlosion and Meganium that we ran in the previous two weeks, you can see that there's pretty much no contest. I don't know if this is just a consequence of the water type, or the water type in Kanto specifically, but wow. Being that the Kanto region has been my region of choice since I started playing Pokémon, I'd say that my bias towards water types is well-founded. Speaking of just how long I've been playing these games, January 29th, just a couple of days ago, 2024, was the 20th year anniversary of Pokémon Fire Red's release in Japan. Happy birthday, Fire Red. And Leaf Green, I guess. I want to extend a special thank you to those of you generous enough to support the channel financially. Your support makes these videos possible so that I can continue to put all of my effort into producing this content for everyone out there to enjoy. From the bottom of my shell, thank you so much. And thank you for making it to the end of the video. Watching until the end of the video, your engagement and subscriptions all help my channel so much. The algorithm determines how my videos are promoted and your engagement informs that algorithm. If you feel like I've earned it, leave a like and comment about the run, what you'd like to see in the future, or just to say hi. Hi there. If you'd like to keep up with my future releases, be sure to subscribe and enable notifications to never miss a video. Next week, we'll be continuing our playthrough of Pokémon White on Tuesday's stream, and on Friday, I have something planned that may well be the most requested, or at least the most talked about run on this channel. Until next time, take care everyone.